The Checkpoints is presented by pharmaceutical company GM Pharma. Minister of Georgia, Irak Likobahidze, said on Thursday that the tender procedures regarding the Anaklia port project will be completed in May. As Irak Likobahidze told the media, infrastructure works will start from June. According to Irak Likobahidze, the government has a clear plan regarding the Anaklia port project. Procedures will start in March. It will take March, April, May to complete the tender. The tender procedure will be completed by the end of May and it will be possible to start the works from June. This is a clear plan that the government has and we will certainly follow this plan, said the Prime Minister. The second stage of rehabilitation works at Narikala Fortress is set to begin, announced Pilisi Mayor Kakakaladze during a meeting of the municipal government. The selected contractor company will be responsible for the rehabilitation with a project cost of 13 million lari. The completion of the works is set for the fall of 2025. The rehabilitation will encompass both the courtyard and the um, outer perimeter of the fortress along with the installation of decorative lighting. Work is scheduled to commence the following week. Otar Nadaraya, the chief economist of TBC Capital, declares that the macroeconomic environment provides an opportunity to soften monetary policy. As Nadaraya told BMG, as a result of the decrease in the refinancing rate, it is expected to encourage lorry loans, but he notes that consumers should not make a decision based on the interest rate alone. Kutaisi Airport has moved from small airports to medium-sized airports in the um, Airports Council International Ratings. According to the data of January 2024, Kutaisi International Airport ranked third among medium-sized airports in Europe with the increase in passenger flow. This is The Checkpoints. I'm Elena Kwanjilashvili, author and the host of the show, and The Checkpoints team is ready to sum up business and economics week for you. During five years of implementation, the USAID Economic Security Program has strengthened the resilience and sustainability of sectors of the Georgian economy with high potential for economic growth and job creation. Through the program, USAID Georgia supported Georgia to create significant economic growth, including a remarkable 65 million USD increase in sales, nearly 5,000 new jobs, professional skills training for 5,000 workers, and the facilitation of 35 strategic partnerships. U.S. Ambassador Robin Dunnigan, Vice Prime Minister Levan Davitashvili, along with various representatives from both the governmental and private sectors, joined the event to commemorate the enduring partnership with the USAID in stimulating the Georgian economy. Over the past several years, the USAID Economic Security Program has significantly expanded its impact by fostering strategic partnerships and synergies between the government, private sector, and civil society. Through an innovative approach that encourages co-design and constructive dialogue. The program creates Georgian solutions to the country's challenges. To strengthen priority sectors, the program provided crucial support through technical assistance and co-share grants aiming to enhance growth and productivity in these targeted sectors. The checkpoint sat down with USAID Economy Growth Office Director Michel Kostielski for a brief interview evaluating the value of the USAID two programs that have drawn to an end economic security program and agriculture program. Ms. Kosielski, thank you for being with us and thank you for thank taking you. my um, questions. Um, let us uh, start uh, um, our interview with two of the programs that have been recently mm -hmm. uh, concluded. That's the agricultural program um, and also uh, economic security mm -hmm. program. What is the aggregated value of these uh, programs for Georgia? Uh, so first, let me just thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come here today and speak about the great work that USAID is doing in Georgia. And USAID, as part of the U.S. government, views Georgia as a strategic partner. And we are here to support Georgia as a secure, prosperous, and democratic partner in the South Caucasus that is firmly integrated with the West. And all of our programs, including the two that you just mentioned, um, you know, work to support those core 
those core values. So to answer your question directly, the, the agricultural program, it is a five-year program. Uh, it launched in 2019 and it is coming to an end now. But through this program, over the course of those five years, we worked very closely with the government of Georgia and also with the private sector to strengthen agricultural value chains and to you know, tap into new lucrative export markets and to create jobs. And similarly, the Economic Security Program is a five-year program, also started in 2019, now coming to an end. But through that program, we also worked with the government of Georgia and also the private sector. And we targeted sectors through that program where we thought would have the greatest potential to create jobs and for private sector investments. And um, we targeted industries such as light manufacturing, solid waste management, tourism, uh, information technology and, and industries like that. So all of our programs, including these two, work to build an economy where more Georgian workers, their families and the communities can benefit from greater economic opportunity. Um, this is analytics we like uh, figures very much. And um, let us uh, deal with the agriculture uh, program um, at, at, uh, at first. Uh, did the program meet uh, all, the, all the targets, all the KPIs, all the expectations that you had for, for the program? Yes, um, in short, yes. Uh, I also love numbers, so I will, you know, I will say that the program did meet its uh, its targeted object objectives and met its, and we've achieved a lot through the program. And perhaps I can give just a couple of data points around this. So the agricultural program, uh, we helped through this program. We helped Georgian businesses businesses create more than 6,000 jobs, and we've also helped generate more than 150 million dollars in new sales. And in addition to that, we've also leveraged $20 million with matching funds from 120 enterprises to help, um, to help establish things like plant nurseries, uh, cold storage units, consolidation centers, things like that. So I would say the program was very successful and definitely met its targets. Um, you uh, briefly mentioned in your introduction uh, uh, and your answer to my first question, but uh, there were specifically five approaches of the agricultural pro program that you were mm -hmm. specifically uh, targeting and to increase productivity and predictive capacity, to build right. capacity, to add value, to meet international standards and mm -hmm. certifications, to strengthen linkages within agricultural value chains and to new markets, and to strengthen capacity of cooperatives, extension, and other service providers and associations. Mm -hmm. which, <clears throat> which of the goals uh, uh, proved to be hardest to achieve right. and easiest to achieve. So, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, you mentioned very accurately that the agricultural program supported Georgia in many different respects. We've worked to provide direct support to businesses, we helped to Georgia to meet international standards and certifications, and we've also worked with the government of Georgia to bolster exports. And over the course of those five years, we learned a lot as well. And one of the key things that we learned is that Georgia's economic success really requires for the country to tap into new lucrative export markets. And specifically around that, one of the things we really learned is that developing and supporting export infrastructure, things like cargo terminals, transportation logistics systems, are really key to being able to access those high value markets. And so because of what we learned through the agricultural program, we actually designed and are planning to launch uh, in 2024 our new USAID's transportation logistics system. Uh, transportation and logistics program. And this program will also partner with the government of Georgia and also with the private sector. And we will be working to strengthen Georgia's transport and also logistics capacity to develop the middle corridor to help build an economy where more Georgians can have better access to economic opportunity. Yeah, um, in, in, the, in the middle of these five years, there was pandemic, mm -hmm. right? right? Did it like reshape some of the, some of the goals or uh, because like, for example, the logistics program that you just mm -hmm. mentioned, it seems it is just the direct answer to the new opportunities that Georgia is facing because of the middle corridor and because of all this re reshuffling of uh, 
mm -hmm. the supply roads, right? So I think that we're always looking for opportunities throughout our programs to learn and to adapt. And usually the way we structure our programs are very flexible so that we can seize opportunities as they arise. And so, you know, just like the agricultural program shifted because of the pandemic, we also, you know, will build this program will also be flexible to be able to adjust and to be able to seize opportunities so that we're, you know, the world isn't static, right? And so we're always looking for how we can learn and how we can do better in our programs and seize opportunities when they come around. Um, do you see that the results that you have achieved will be sustainable in the in the long run? Because the, the just uh, talking about the only about the agriculture uh, program. I mean, these are quite impressive figures that you have mm -hmm. just mentioned for 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 five year program for such a small market as, as Georgia. So I think, you know, when it comes to sustainability, we always one of the core things we look at when we're designing programs is we look at issues around sustainability. And one of the things that we do to ensure sustainability is we don't work in silo. We work, and I mentioned this earlier, we work in partnership with the government. With the government of Georgia, we work in partnership with the private sector, we work in partnership you know, when when uh, when appropriate and possible with educational institutions, with civil society. So we're always looking to work um, you know, with, 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 with stakeholders in the sectors that we are providing support in because that ensures the sustainability of our programs. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, what, what was the economic security? You briefly mentioned that you were targeting like those uh, sectors where you saw the, the biggest promises for, for Georgia's economic mm -hmm. uh, growth. Uh, did this program like envision any types of like reforms or structural reforms targeting targeting this, this sustainability among, among others? Or was it just a technical assistance to, uh, to, to the stakeholders? So we did a variety of things under the program, actually. And maybe I can, just because we were talking about data points and analytics earlier, give a couple of examples. Through the program, we were able to increase our sales by $60 million, or increase sales of Georgian businesses by $60 million. And we created new, nearly 5,000 new jobs in these targeted industries, like light manufacturing, creative industries, um, and tourism. And so, you know, there, there was a, a variety of different ways we provided this type of support. And one of the things we also did is we conducted a midterm evaluation to, you know, to, as we, we are always looking for ways to improve, we're always looking to see if we're meeting our objectives. And so when we did a midterm evaluation, one of the things that we learned and confirmed is that our assistance to, you know, small and medium-sized enterprises really helped, you know, help strengthen that economic uh, ecosystem where we were able to help these enterprises grow to create jobs and also to be competitive on the international market. Mm, that's another step to sustainability. Right. Um, uh, also, uh, it was very um, interesting when I was reading about the program while uh, mm. preparing for uh, for this uh, interview that in the solutions part of the program, this description had only two words, and that was economic uh, growth. So how are you going to evaluate that? Uh, I mean, what was the um, what was the value of the program uh, mm -hmm. to the uh, to the economic growth? I mean. I mean, will USAID be doing like I don't know, Alexandria, or who who should be doing that? Who should be um, evaluating that specific target? Because that's right. very important, of course. So one of the things that, and that's a great question. One of the things that we do is, I mentioned the midterm evaluation is we, we do on our programs midterm and sometimes like evaluations at the end of the programs to make sure that they've met the targets and that we're taking into account lessons. Um, and so I mentioned that we did the uh, midterm evaluation that confirmed that we were um, we were providing that our assistance to these small and medium-sized enterprises was successful to help those businesses grow and to compete on inter international markets. Um, I would say specifically uh, RIA, the regulatory impact assessment, that was something that we are doing right now on our economic governance program and specifically for so that program those because are like kind of right and so that is that's the that's the type of assessment we're doing on that program because of the type of assistance we're providing through that which is working in partnership with parliaments and the governments of Georgia to help support economic reforms to benefit more Georgian workers and their families and communities. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so these different programs that USA 
lady mm -hmm. uh, have kind of like make a puzzle, like they are mm -hmm. different parts of the puzzle, and it's totally understandable. Yes. Uh, green is a key, new keyword for 2024, mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, not only USAID, just all the development partners of, of uh, Georgia, all the IFIs have this buzzword and this mm -hmm. keyword in their uh, programs looking forward. Uh, how will the USAID be using this this word and what type of um, change will mm -hmm. this uh, um, green word uh, bring? Because uh, um, there are three uh, upcoming programs on the agenda, green economy, green logistics, and green agriculture programs. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, so yes, so climate-friendly economic growth is a key priority for the United States and as, as it is for Georgia and some of Georgia's international partners like the European Union. So, you know, the United States is working in partnership with countries around the world, like Georgia, to help invest in green growth. And by doing that, we're hoping that we can ensure that green, that economic, economic growth aligns with efforts to you know, mitigate things like climate change, to reduce the environmental impact, to reduce pollution, to ensure energy security. So, yes, I would say that, you know, green is the word for 2024. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I hope you will be our guest with these new programs as well when they will be. Uh, I would rolling. be happy to. Thank you so great. much. Thank you so much. How did the economy perform this week? Here is our brief weekly economic news and outlook. Georgian Prime Minister Erik Gobahidze on Thursday said the main national task of his government was to eradicate poverty and unemployment in Georgia. Gobahidze highlighted that over a million people had previously lived below the poverty line and currently the number was to 600,000 and noted it was the historic low for the country. The head of government pointed out the role of rapid economic growth, including the double-digit growth in 2021 and 2022, in overcoming poverty and unemployment and emphasized the importance of implementing large-scale infrastructure projects, construction of highways, development of important airports in order to create more jobs in the country. The Prime Minister also said the government continued to work in all directions to ensure the creation of jobs in Georgia and increase the wages of employees in the country. The foreign direct investments in Georgia amounted to 1.6 billion USD in 2023, down 24 percent from the adjusted data of 2022. Decrease in debt instruments is considered to be the main reason for the reduction of FDI, according to the preliminary data from the National Statistics Office of Georgia. The share of major foreign direct investor countries in FDI stands as follows: the United Kingdom, Netherlands, and Turkey. The largest share of FDI was registered in the financial and insurance activity sector, reaching 288 million USD in quarter for 2023. Transport sector was the second with 22.9 USD million, followed by the real estate activity sectors with 22.8 million USD. Lasha Khutsishvili, Minister of Finance of Georgia, met with the IMF mission on Monday. The International Monetary Fund started its visit to the country to carry out its periodic consultations with authorities as scheduled in advance. Meeting of IMF mission with Lasha Khutsishvili, Minister of Finance of Georgia, was also attended by Deputy Ministers Georgi Kakauridze, Ekaterine Guntsadze, and Mirza Gelashvili. Current IMF mission aims to access the existing macroeconomic position of the country along with its fiscal and monetary policies. The Minister of Finance of Georgia shared information with the IMF mission on the current trend of budget execution and mid-term projections of the country. As noted at the meeting, post-pandemic macroeconomic parameters of Georgia evidence resilience and fiscal parameters returning to the benchmark indicators. In parallel with the support demonstrated to reforms and capital expenditure projects, work will progress towards mid- and long-term analysis, forecasting and planning instruments to be further improved and perfected.
Significance of EU candidacy granted to Georgia was highlighted along with role in the public fund management reform agenda. Together, the authorities and member organizations of over 80 countries working in this area around the world and serves as international platform for important interaction among successful countries. Georgian Infrastructure Minister Irakli Karseladze on Wednesday said the slope stabilization project cost of 62 million lari is carried out at high pace at Rikoti Pass. There are intensive works on the slope near this section, where a potential landslide center was discovered in 2023. Relevant studies were conducted and engineering solution was prepared. A detour was arranged and the tender identified a quality contractor who is currently performing a very large scale work. Carcelada said the minister at the execution of airs masses was currently underway, which involved developing the slope with a stairway system. Carcelada added that two of the three tunnels on Chumateleti heavy section of the project had already been cut and 11 of 70 bridges built. The Ministry of Infrastructure said the Chumateleti heavy section was geologically the most challenging part of the pass where a major effort was on stabilization of slopes with appropriate design and engineering solutions. Mikhail Sarjolade, Georgia's new health minister, said that he received an instruction from the prime minister to meet decision with the involvement of medical community and interested stakeholders. According to Mikhail Sarjoladze, it would take some time for him to become familiarized with the current situation in the ministry to respond to the questions, speak about various programs and means how to resolve problems, among them the development around the Republican Hospital and DRG system, a new model of financing clinics. We will listen to all the opinions of the medical community and based on that the best model will be selected that will benefit the country and each patient. The main determinant here is to protect the patient's best interest, said the Minister. Prime Minister Irak Kobachize appointed Mikhail Sarjola, the Prime Minister of Ruling Georgia and Dream Party as the Minister of IDP Labour, Health and Social Affairs on March 10. Mikhail Sarjola, the Chairman of Parliamentary Human Rights and Civil Integration, Committee replaced Surab Azarashvili on the position. Surab Azarashvili, former Georgian Minister of IDP's Labour, Health and Social Affairs, resigned on March 1. The Georgian government offered citizens the chance to obtain an ID card for free from March 15 in a bid to ensure the replacement of non-electric ID cards with electric ID cards. According to the state service development agents, in order to replace the non-electric ID card issued before 2011 with an electric ID card free of charge citizens should apply to the houses of justice and mobile houses of justice throughout the country. According to the amendments to the law of Georgia on the procedure for issuing registration identity certificates and passports of Georgian citizens, of Georgian citizens and foreign living in Georgia. From July 1, 2024, non-electric identity cards issued before July 28, 2011 will be cancelled. Tbilisi Mayor Kakakalade has once again urged holders of Category A taxi permits to activate their permits before April 1. He emphasized the importance of the ongoing taxi reform and informed permit holders that failing to activate their permits by the specified data will result in authentic cancellation. Owners wishing to retain their permits can find information about the activation process on the website taxi.bilisi.gov.au and Tbilisi City Hall hotline. Kalade highlighted the various stages of reform and urged permit holders to act promptly to avoid permit cancellation. Georgian Economy Minister Levan Davitashvili on Thursday said development of the domestic capital market was one of the most active directions of the government's structural reforms. Speaking at the Capital Markets International Conference in Tbilisi, Davitashvili highlighted the importance of the capital market in the economic picture of the country, main aspects of its development and the role of the state in the process. He said with the status of a European Union membership candidate country and the role of the middle corridor logistics role, 
wrote, Georgia had the ambition to become a regional hub of financial services. We see the growth of the middle class and wealth in our region can mobilize more long-term capital, he said. The minister uh, assessed the current macroeconomic situation and main trends necessary for the development of the capital market, saying all parameters were present in the country for the capital market to become active, adding the government had implemented appropriate policies to support this process. There are two major macroeconomic trends that require the development of the capital market in the country. Georgia's economy is undergoing significant structural transformation. On the one hand, there is a tendency to accumulate long-term domestic capital, which is caused by pension and insurance reforms. And on the other hand, there is an increasing demand for long-term capital, which is caused by, by our development policy, he told the event. In order to bridge these two current trends, it is vital to develop effective long-term capital allocation mechanisms. Achieving this goal is the main goal of the government within the capital market reform, David Ashwili said. The minister added the government had improved relevant uh, legislation over the past five years to create a sustainable and predictable regulatory environment for the capital market. In response to the dynamic evolution of the local capital market, TBC Capital has launched a new initiative, Capital Markets International Conference, which was held for the first time last week. The conference featured leading entities from both local and international capital markets, including JP Morgan City, um, Fidelity Investments, the National Bank of Georgia, the Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia, and others. BMG's business evening host, Georgi Aroni, attended the conference and talked to Managing Director of J.P. Morgan in the um, CMEA, Stefan Weiler, about the development of the local capital market and its potential. Mr. Weiler, hi. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, um, I know that you travel quite a lot to Georgia, but it's the first time for Business Media Georgia that we have the opportunity to talk to um, J.P. Morgan, the biggest bank of, uh, in, in the world representative. So thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be in Tbilisi. Pleasure to talk to you. Mr. Weiler, we are here for the conference, International Capital Market Conference organized by TBC Capital. First of all, uh, let me ask you about the event. Um, do you think that such events um, play a big role in developing the local capital market ecosystem? And if yes, um, how particularly? Okay. Yeah, no, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a great facilitator you know, to um, helping to achieve an objective. And the objective is to develop the local capital markets. Um, I think TBC has done an outstanding job in pulling together all the relevant um, you know, partners, whether these are pr prospective existing issuers, government official banks like us, um, local participants. And so there's, I think it's a great um, forum to um, exchange views, exchange ideas, um, and hopefully make progress towards um, you know, creating a better platform that will allow you know, local markets to, to develop further. Um, it's of great interest to local participants to have a deeper local market, and a uh, you know, deeper local market typically also means better economic growth um, as financing becomes more available. Uh, also means less risk right, for the borrowers as they can match their cash flows. And so I think it's very timely and a, and a great initiative, and I hope it becomes an annual event. Let's uh, discuss the local market, which um, there was a boom in recent years in terms of obligations and bonds, which uh, definitely is a good sign for, um, for the country as big companies, corporations are issuing more and more bonds. Could you evaluate what is happening in Georgia and then put it into the regional perspective as well in terms of capital market development? Yeah, we've seen, um, we've seen an, uh, definitely a strong uptick in local issuances. Um, we at JP Morgan are not directly involved in those. You know, our value add is more connecting local borrowers with international investors. Um, but we have um, a number of conversations also with local borrowers about local currency denominated international bonds. So this is for borrowers that may require a bigger capacity uh, than what is available in the local market. I know that uh, there have been many reforms um, undertaken to make the local market um, more attractive and, and maybe create um, almost like a financial hub within the region. Um, I think that's the objective from, from the government officials as well as the, the national bank. Um, I think there's more to do. Um, one potential catalyst that, um, that, 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 
that could be on the horizon is the, the pension funds participation or, or more prominent participation in the local market. I know that they have quite significant assets under management. I understand about four and a half billion, um, but their participation so far in the local <coughs> fixed income market has been quite limited. When we look at other um, markets or jurisdictions in the kind of broader region in Central Europe, um, you see that pension fund reform often is a catalyst for local market development. So I think there's, a, there's an opportunity that the, um, the local pension fund can play. Um, but there are also some other, some other um, features that, um, that, you know, that, that could be implemented to, to make the market more attractive, both for local and international investors, because um, a liquid local market also means you have international investor participation. What are the trends that you see in Georgia that could, based on your vast experience in different markets, could be um, catalysts for the growth of the local capital, mar cap capital market, except for the pension fund? Another catalyst uh, would be to make it um, easier for international investors to access the domestic market. Um, I understand currently um, a local bank account, for example, is required in order to um, participate in the, in the domestic market. Um, so that is somewhat of a hindrance. It's not an, um, a hindrance that can be, um, you know, that cannot be overcome. But um, international investors will compare that access to to, to other markets they're they're, they're interested in and, and, and active in. And so I think that that may be another one where um, you know the authorities can simplify access to to you know, for international investors. I'd like to return to your point about Georgia becoming possibly the regional hub. Um, first of all, let me ask you about the context, uh, in the context of uh, neighboring countries, the countries within the region. Is Georgia ahead of them in terms of um, that capital market? And if yes, um, does it really, does our country really have the opportunity to transform into a sort of regional hub? Mm -hmm. um, I'll answer the question more on the international capital market side, because this is where, again, where we um, have expertise and, uh, and more knowledge. Um, I think there's, there's two ways of answering your question. One is, if you look at the overall outstanding debt stock of, um, of Georgia internationally versus um, uh, peers in the region, it's very low. It's only 1.85 billion at the moment. Um, only Moldova and Tajikistan are lower. Um, if you exclude the government or, or sovereign, sovereign financings from it, um, and you take into account the relative size of the economy in Georgia, then the conclusion actually is that Georgian companies and banks are utilizing international markets more than peers in the region. Um, so it's a relative, um, it's, it's a relative comment, right? In the, because scale for international market is very important, right? So, you know, a market um, such as Georgia, we have, you have a GDP of approximately 30 billion now. Um, there is a limited number of, of issuers that have the necessary scale right, to, to issue 300, 500 million dollar or, or euro type transactions. Whereas, if you look at markets like, um, you know pre-war in, in Russia or Ukraine, much bigger economies, and therefore there's a lot more borrowers that have the scale to access the market, which they did. But on a relative basis to, uh, to the size of the economy, Georgia has actually done really well. What are the risks that you see in Georgia in terms of developing financial infrastructure, financial capital markets? Um, look, there's, I think investors will look at, um, one is the scale. It's a small market. You've had, in the history of um, international issuance, there have only been eight borrowers from, from Georgia. Um, so there is, it's, it's a small market, and investors will have to commit resources to follow it. And um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is that, um, to my earlier point, issuances will be small, um, which means they're also illiquid. And for, one, for some investors, um, liquidity is very important. I'd say probably for many investors, liquidity is very important. And that's, that's a hindrance right? in, in order to get more participation uh, from, from accounts around the world. Um, and then I think thirdly, you, know, you are in a geopolitical hot zone, <laughs> if I can call it that. Right? So, um, and there's been precedents in other countries, but also in Georgia itself right? in, in 2008, where geopolitics changed the risk profile suddenly. Right. And so that's always something that um, you know, investors have to, to consider and to get, be, be comfortable with. Let me ask you this. Given uh, 
everything that you mentioned, you know, obviously Georgia is a small country with a small economy and uh, the scale at which um, capital market can be developed is also limited. Based on everything that, what could Georgia do in terms of um, creating its own niche? You know, obviously the scale cannot be as big as other countries, uh, but what could be the, the alley, you know, the niche that Georgia could develop so, th so that it somehow the capital markets that we have inside then drive the growth mm -hmm. of the economy? I think um, Georgia has actually already kind of developed its niche amongst international investors and it really started, you know, with the government um, all the way back to 2007 when we did the first sovereign bond. and. Um, you know, investors are very much related to the open market, you know, policies in, in, in Georgia. Um, they're very much related to the transparency, the proactivity and in sharing information, engaging with investors, to building relationships, participating in conferences, um, having investor relations. And so Georgia is regarded as a very transparent and open market, um, especially relative to regional peers, right? So. Um, I would say that you know, Georgia enjoys an elevated status amongst investors and um, uh, elevated status in terms of trust. And, um, and that's very important, right? So you, you, need, you need to have that. I think the, the, the major hindrance of more issuance is, is really scale. Um, and that takes time, right? So it's, it's really about you know, time and um, preparing new borrowers and, and preparing borrowers that become um, large enough for international issuances um, to you know, implement uh, similar policies that um, you know peers in the in the past have done, and you know follow solid corporate governance, which is which is also very important. I'd like to ask you uh, the last question, which is about um, the European integration. Um, Georgia is um, heading uh, towards uh, EU integration. Obviously, this will not happen in, in the very near future, but it is the tra trajectory that our country has. In your opinion, what will uh, this? How will this affect Georgia's capital markets in general in terms of you know accept acceptance of the European regulation, mm -hmm. which is already happening, but will happen even more in the future? And in general, you know, the trajectory that Georgia has towards the EU. Uh, what role, what, how will it help develop the local mm -hmm. capital markets and in general the economy? Yeah, no, the, um, the, um, the candidacy is, is very market friendly. Um, if the government continues to pursue the EU accession, which um, based on population polls seems highly likely, I, I read that 90% uh, of the population you know, support um, an accession to the EU, so the government should be motivated to implement the necessary reforms to, to achieve that goal. Um, if you look at other Central European countries who've gone through um, the same process, um, it takes a few years typically right, to, to go through and um, um, implement the reforms. Um, probably six, seven years. Croatia, I think it took eight years, but on average maybe six years. So I think there's a reasonable objective or let's say likelihood for, for Georgia to, to see an EU accession as maybe 2030. I mean, um, I'm just, you know, I think it's a, it would be a reasonable goal. If that happens and all these <coughs> uh, reforms are implemented and there's a consolidation with um, you know, European institutions, it should have a positive impact on ratings. And, and so, you know, from my personal um, perspective, I wouldn't see it unlikely that Georgia would migrate towards and probably into investment grade, right? um, you know, from where, where it currently stands. That means funding costs will be lower. That means you have a broader investor base that can invest. And that altogether means funding costs should be lower, yeah? um, which um, hopefully would also mean that you can spur growth. And with growth comes scale, and you have more borrowers. Mr. Weiler, thank you very much for the interview. Let's hope that the next time we talk, um, you know, the issuance, uh, the total bonds that the companies and the government have issued has increased and maybe we have made additional steps towards EU integration as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for talking to me. What was new in business this week? On to our reporter, Natia Taktakishvili. 
plastic surgery costs are increased by 10% in Georgia due to the global price surge on the international market. The price of plastic surgery procedures in Georgia varies by the clinics, but the average cost starts from 2,000 lari and in some cases it reaches 35,000 lari. According to the plastic surgeon Gia Guaramia, if a small surgical intervention is required, the prices are lower, noting that it costs over 500 lari to remove yellow spots from the eyes. However, if the plastic surgery is carried out under four-hour anesthesia, the price can amount to 17,000 lari. The price of breast plastic surgery starts from 7,000 lari and reaches 20,000 lari. The cost of rhinoplasty ranges from 2,500 lari to 7,000 lari, says the plastic surgeon Gia Guaramia. Although plastic surgery is not considered low budget for Georgia, the difference compared to the international market is significant. As Gia Guaramia points out quality service can be obtained in Georgia at four or five times cheaper than in Europe or the USA. Gold price increased by 15% on the international exchange market year on year. As the director of Zarabhana Tornike Samkharadze says, the price of precious metal has increased in Georgia as well, although the company still maintains the price of its products. According to him, if the price of gold continues to rise, the company will have to adjust the prices. The price of pure gold has also increased by 4 lari in Georgia, which is quite a serious growth. We are not in a hurry to increase the price. However, if this trend is maintained, we will have to adjust the cost, said the director of Zarabhana. The history of Zarabhana begins in 1939 and produces jewelry from natural and precious stones, as well as semi-precious and unprecious stones. The company creates gold, silver and copper jewelry based on the best jewelry traditions. Georgi Kevanishvili, general director of Lopata Lake Resort and Spa, declares that launching of Tel Aviv International Airport will take the potential of Kakhati region to another level. As he told BMDG, company welcomes any step forward that serves the development of tourist potential in Kakhati region. Our business vision, including having an international airport in Tel Aviv since the establishment of the resort. The mentioned decision will take Kakhati's tourist potential to a completely different level. Georgi Kevanishvili said, at the first stage, Tel Aviv International Airport will be intended for domestic flights, including Batumi, Messia, Kutaisi and Ambrolauri. However, the airport plans to launch international flights from 2027. Lopota Lake Resort and Spa has 232 rooms and employs 350 people. The average cost of a hotel stay, including breakfast and VAT, amounts to 210 USD during the summer season. Swedish premium brand Volvo Car Georgia offers customers a discount of up to 30,000 lari on Volvo XC60 and XC90. Both Volvo models are plug-in hybrids, which means that the cars are equipped with an electric motor and an internal consumption engine. We all understand that taking care of the environment is one of the most important issues. However, the infrastructural challenges in Georgia should be taken into account, which are mostly answered by plug-in hybrids. One of the main advantages of Volvo plug-in hybrid is that after charging the car, it's possible to move with the hybrid engine and use the electric engine only when necessary, for example for traffic jams. Besides, if you can't charge the car, it can charge itself while driving, said Tornike. Ikashvili, head of sales of Volvo Car Georgia. Volvo Car Caucasus, part of Tegeta Cars, is the official importer of Swedish brand Volvo in Caucasus region and the Central Asia. The company is an exclusive supplier of premium class cars in Georgia, Uzbekistan, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Kazakhstan was added to the list last year. Georgian cosmetics company Peel Natural started exporting to Pakistan. Tatu Kalom Tadze, the founder of the company, spoke about this in TV program Women's Narrative. It was very unexpected for us as we were working for Kuwait and our products decided introduce our cosmetics to the Pakistan market as well, she said, adding that at the first stage, 27,000 units of Peel Natural's products were assigned to Pakistan. According to her, negotiations are carried out in other markets as well. Currently, the company produces 150 types of products. However, it's working on expanding the assortment. We constantly try to offer new products to our cosmetics, both in 
Georgia and beyond the borders. We have about seven new formulas ready, which will increase the company's productivity and the employee salaries. Also, we are planning to go to Italy and Spain, although we are not taking big steps in this regard yet. Now we are mostly focused on our markets, said Tatu Kalomtadze. Appeal Naturals is a Georgian brand which has been operating in Georgia for almost eight years and offers customers organic self-care products. Georgian brand Situationis participated in Paris Fashion Week with the support of Solo and Visa. The fashion house represented its fall winter collection, which combined Georgian traditional heritage and modern design. Each model created by the brand is unique because they are made in Situationis atelier and the tailors always leave their signature on them. At this stage, the brand refuses mass production. It should be noted that Situationist allows the customers to make the item even more unique by leaving own handwriting on the selected item with choosing the material or color. One of the priorities of Situationist is taking care of the environment along with sustainability. The brand aims to reduce waste. For this, the company orders the exact amount of material needed to make clothes and accessories. It also offers vegan alternatives to leather products. Situationist is a brand founded in 2017 by Georgian self-taught designer Irakli Rusadze, which is distinguished by its own identity and values in the local and international market. The bag and accessories producing brand Cosmo declares that state support is important for business development as Sopo Mukhlishuli, co-founder of Cosmo, said the main challenge is finding new partners. According to her, the company has the biggest partner from the Denmark at this stage. Cosmo exports a large number of bags and accessories to this market. As she notes, in order to meet their standards, the company actively worked on the quality for six months. Free trade agreement is very important. It helped us a lot in communication. International buyers don't have information about free trade, which we think is a challenge. Many Georgian companies should work on this and we should talk about the benefits of this agreement. The European market is very important for the stability of Georgian business, says Mukhlishvili. According to her, they started talking part in exhibitions three years ago and as of the today they have eight branches in Georgia and export their products to seven EU countries. They are also actively represented in non-EU markets. Bias Wine is expanding its exporting markets this year. The founder of the winery, Baya Abuladze, stated that at the end of the year, the company plans to switch to new capacities. Late this year, we will be able to transfer our winery to new capacities. In addition, we plan to enter the new market in 2024, including Turkey. We also have a very interesting offer from Denmark. I hope it will be a busy year, said Baya Abuladze, noting that Bias Wine is currently sold in seven new countries. The founder of Bias Wine also talks about the challenges in the process of operation and notes that they faced many challenges at the initial stage. The reason for this was that they had to find a reliable partner in different countries. This process is still going. According to her, international and local exhibitions played an important role in finding new partners. Bias Wine has been operating on the market since 2015 and offers seven types of wine to the customers. The company's factory is located in Baghdati and its annual production volume is about 18,000 bottles of wine. The social enterprise Cafe restaurant Kafune, located in Rustavi, plans to activate in the catering direction. Director of Kafune, Luca Koberidze, stated this in an interview with BMDG. This year, we are planning to become more active in the direction of catering, which means serving food at business or private events. At the moment, we can provide food for up to 150 people, said the director of Kafune. According to him, the goal of the company is to meet HASP standard before summer. We want to meet the HASP standard, therefore our cafe restaurant will be temporarily closed in order to carry out appropriate repair work and adapt to the standards. We have invested about 200,000 lari in the facility in total only this year. The investment volume made up 50,000 lari, which was spent on improving the working space and laundry, I said Luca Koberidze. Social enterprise and cafe restaurant Kafune has been operating on the market for 40 years. At this stage, the social enterprise employs 16 people. 
On March 13, 2024, the Monetary Policy Committee of the National Bank of Georgia decided to reduce the monetary policy uh, rate, refinancing rate, by 0.75 percentage points. The policy rate now stands at 8.25 percent. In Georgia, a low inflation environment is sustained and headline inflation is well below the target, NBG says. In February, the overall price level increased by 0.3 percent annually, while the core inflation at 2.4 percent. It is noteworthy that low inflation is a result of both domestic as well as external factors. When, uh, on the one hand, the key um, driving factor of lower inflation is the declining prices on domestically produced products, uh, 2.4 percent, resulting from tight monetary policy and slowdown in inflation expectations. On the other hand, price pressures stemming from external shocks, such as those caused by the war and the pandemic, have significantly weakened, contributing to a lower overall inflation rate. At the same time, the real effective exchange rate keeps its strong position, which supports the inflation and important goods to stay at a low level. The low inflation environment helps the inflation expectations decline, which further significantly lowers the inflationary risks in the medium term. Other things being equal, inflation is expected to remain below the target of 3% at the beginning of 2024, NBG says while stabilizing close to it in the medium term. Despite the existing inflationary risks, NBG says their severity has decreased. One of the major inflationary risks is heightened prices on international transportation due to ongoing Red Sea tensions. The hostilities in this region are still ongoing. However, shipment costs after surging in December and January declined to some extent in February. Meanwhile, as it was expected, local economic activity is gradually approaching its potential trend, NBG says. According to the preliminary estimates of the NBG, in January, annual economic growth equaled 5.8 percent, which indicates the neutralization of demand-driven inflationary pressures. According to the National Bank of Georgia's projections, with the gap between economic activity and its pre-pandemic trend being fully closed, um, it is anticipated that the growth of economic activity in 2024 will gradually normalize around that of potential GDP. In light of the above-mentioned factors and the analysis of the current stance, the National Bank of Georgia continues its exit from its tight monetary policy stance, reducing the policy rate by 0.75 percentage points to 8.25 percent. Nevertheless, should factors amplifying inflation expectations and external sector risks become apparent, other things equal maintaining the current tight stance for a longer period or further policy tightening may become necessary, the NBG says. The NBG continuously monitors the developments in the economy and financial markets and will use all available tools to ensure price stability. The next meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee will take place on May 8, 2024. General Director of TBC Bank Vahdan Butskrikidze deeply believes that reducing the refinancing rate will encourage economic growth for 2024. According to him, along with the reduction of interest rate on variable loans, the dollarization will increase and the systemic risks of banks will decline further. Cutting the refinancing rate will have several important effects on the economy. On the one hand, interest rates will be reduced for a major part of our population, while on the other, this trend will increase the volume of loans in Larry, which will further reduce bank systemic risks. The third thing is that it will further encourage the granting of loans to small and medium as well as large businesses and will contribute to the economic growth for 2024, says Butskrikidze. Iraklik Ovzanadze, the former chairman of the Finance and Budget Committee of the Parliament, declares that both the IMF and the government should show flexibility regarding the restoration of the International Monetary Funds program. Ovzanadze urges the parties to hold dialogues and take compromise steps. Today, I think there are certain conditions regarding the restoration of the program. I think the fund, as well as the parties participating in the program, can show some flexibility in this regard. The recipient of the program is both the Minister of Finance and the National Bank. We have adjusted the macroeconomic parameters. The budget deficit came down from 9% to 3%. The budget parameters are in order. There are still issues related to the National Bank, but it is possible to reach compromises to restore the program, said Iraklik of Zanatem.
On October 4, the IMF said that the IMF supported standby arrangement with Georgia is delayed rather than suspended. According to the IMF, the approval of the second review has been delayed due to the IMF's disapproval of the change in the management structure and the recent decision on amendments to the sanctions regulations of the National Bank of Georgia. On September 19, the National Bank of Georgia announced that by the decision of the bank's acting president, international sanctions will not apply to a Georgian citizen who has not been found guilty by a Georgian court. With this change, the National Bank of Georgia reversed its prior decision and restored access to bank assets and the right to carry out financial transactions to Otar Partskhaladze after he was sanctioned by the United States Treasury uh, Department. And that's all for today. We will meet next Sunday, um, 11 a.m. sharp. But before that, of course, follow us on BM.G for more news and outlook in business and economics and beyond in Georgia and beyond. Checkpoints is presented by pharmaceutical company GM Pharma.